Welcome right. to San Antonio, everyone. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Everybody ready? Let's do it. All right. Well, uh, I'm Joaquin Gostro. I'm Congressman for District 20 here in San Antonio. And I'm honored to welcome to San Antonio uh, several members of Congress who have come to visit the family detention centers at Carnes, which we did today, and Dilly, which we'll do tomorrow. You know, recently, many of us signed a letter, about 135 members of Congress, expressing to the Obama administration that we don't believe that women and children should be kept in these detention centers. We also strongly believe that many of these folks uh, should have their chance to apply for asylum, and we believe would qualify as asylees. And in, it's in that spirit that we visited uh, Carnes today. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to first uh, Zoe Lofgren, who is from California, and uh, she is the ranking member on the subcommittee within the Judiciary Committee that deals with immigration issues uh, to give you her impressions and what we learned today. Thank you very much, Joaquin. It is great to be uh, in the district of Congressman Castro, who is such a leader uh, in the House of Representatives, newly there, but very well respected. Uh, we did have a chance to visit uh, the facility at Horns today, and we wanted to see uh, firsthand and hear from the mothers and children who were there, uh, how the experience that they were having. Uh, we did learn a lot from listening to those families, but before talking about that, I think it's important to lay the groundwork that American immigration law <coughs> provides that if you have been a victim of oppression, you can legally present yourself at the border of the United States and make an application for political asylum. It's not illegal. That's what the law allows you to do. And in fact, that's what these uh, young families have done. Now, they are in uh, a uh, locked facility uh, that feels quite a bit like a jail. I would say it is a jail camp. Um, and they uh, are, the children are experiencing uh, various forms of distress, uh, and it is very difficult for lawyers to get out to this facility to actually uh, put the cases together. You know, we're not saying that every uh, mom who's in that jail camp should get political asylum. That's for a judge to decide. What we are saying is that they've committed no crime, their, their cases should be heard in an orderly manner, and there's no way to choose the most expensive possible alternative for them while their cases are pending. We know that the religious community uh, has stepped forward and offered to manage their cases, to make sure that these families show up for court, and then we'll see if, they, if their application is successful, they will get asylum. If it's not successful, they will have to leave. That's what the law uh, provides, and we would ask no more than that. But what we would ask is that the jailing of uh, mothers, and especially the children, uh, be stopped in exchange for a more effective and more cost-effective way of ensuring that these uh, individuals uh, have their day in court. And with that, I would turn it over to uh, Mr. Gutierrez, who is a leader on immigration in our country. First of all, um, thank you, Joaquin, um, for hosting this trip. Um, Joaquin Castro once said to us that if we're going to truly be a country of fairness and of justice, then we need to understand that our asylum laws need to be a reflection of that. Um, he made clear to us one day, and I think today we learned it once again, that in America, Joaquin said, we've become used to, and we understand, and we appreciate, and we accept when somebody <coughs> leaves a country because there's a despot there, right? And there's a tyrant, and their liberties of free speech are trampled upon, and they're jailed, sometimes killed. We understand when people come to them. But that we also need to understand that sometimes people come from countries in which there is no protection, where there are murderous gangs, cartels that murder, rape, pillage, and control the everyday aspect of people's lives. 
worse than any dictator that someone has come here fleeing. And that those children and those individuals should be afforded the same right to what? To have their day in court. That's all we're asking for. And in the interim period, if you jail people, and we met a woman who's going to meet her, who's going to have her first anniversary, one year. She had a child that was three years old when she came to America. The child has turned four years old. A quarter of that child's life has been in a detention center. It's so all that kid knows, those four walls and that detention center. It's been here a year. It's, it's just utter, it doesn't make any sense. It's cruel punishment, and it's punishment. And so you say to yourself, well, at least they did something wrong. What did they do wrong? I ask you, what did they do wrong? They appeared before agents of the government of the United States and said, help me. I need help. I need to be protected. And our asylum laws afford them that opportunity. You shouldn't jail a person and punish a person for following the law of the United States of America. Otherwise, then just eliminate the asylum laws of the United States because we really are turning our backs upon them. And so I think that's what we learned today. You know, it's not about what colors you paint the rooms and how many nurseries you have and dentists and doctors and what the food tastes like. Although all of those things are important. That's not really what this is about. They could, op they, they, could, they could make this the nicest, most beautiful place in the world. It's still jail. Those children are still suffering irreparable harm. They're suffering, anybody will tell you, ask any social worker, any expert, anybody that knows anything about children, what happens when they are jailed and incarcerated. On this. And then they came fleeing. They came fleeing what? A crime. And then we treat them as though they're criminals. That's wrong. Lastly, I want to say to Joaquin, to all of my colleagues, um, and Steny, thanks a lot. It's really good to have the second ranking member of the Democratic Party and the House of Representatives, Joaquin, uh, with you here uh, in San Antonio. Thank you so much. The rest of us, you know, we're all good, right? But it's good to show, because it shows the leadership um, that we have in the House of Representatives and the importance that this issue has. So, look, the woman that we met with and the children, I wish you would have an opportunity to be surrounded by not five, not 10, not 15, not 20, 50 women with children. All saying, you should have seen the, the hope that all of you brought to their eyes today. You could see they said, somebody has come. They watched the was inside the facility. They get it. They, 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 they know. And, they, and I'm, I've never felt so good about being a member of Congress as there. So let me just say, end with this. Look, they told us that it costs $127,000 a year. Oh, you don't have a $5,000 bail bond. So I'm going to spend $127,000 a year keeping you in jail because you don't have a $5,000 bond? Tell me where that makes sense to keep somebody in jail at the expense of one hundred because you don't have a $5,000 bond. It makes no sense. Gracias. Yo creo que es bien importante. Joaquín, gracias por habernos recibido y gracias por las atenciones y la generosidad de tu tiempo. Joaquín Castro... Lleva poco tiempo en el Congreso, pero ha dejado ya sus huellas claras. Um, él me ha enseñado a mí mucho. Yo sé que muchos de ustedes, ah, Luis Gutiérrez, el experto de inmigración. No, Joaquín me enseñó que en este país nosotros tenemos que enseñarle a la gente que un dictador es malo. Y recibimos a la gente cuando vienen huyendo dictaduras políticas. Pero hay dictaduras de establecimiento y carteles criminales que son tan viciosas y malas como cualquier dictador y en este país necesitamos entender que las dos son causa para que este país abre su corazón a aquellos que vienen buscando auxilio. Gracias, Joaquín. Thank you, Luis. And, so, and before I open it up to questions, I'll just say, of course, that it was a very emotional visit with uh, a lot of the mothers and children 
uh, and to hear about their experience and everything they're going through. But to, to reiterate, uh, we believe that these women and children should not be kept in these detention camps, that they are people who come here seeking asylum. Uh, they didn't try to evade Border Patrol. They presented themselves at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, that they are not hardened criminals, but by keeping them in these places, we are treating them that way, uh, and that we really need to rethink our conception of asylees and refugees in this country. As Luis was saying, I told the president last year, and I believe it, that when we think of refugees, we often think, or folks seeking political asylum, we think of people who are fleeing communism. For example, those that fled from Fidel Castro, or those who fled from Vietnam, uh, and other places that were wrecked by communism. But in the world today, people also flee very desperate situations brought on, for example, by violent drug lords who rule over a country. Uh, and if you could hear all the stories uh, that these women told and the persecution that they <coughs> hear at the hands of these drug lords in a society, societies that have not been able to fully contain the violence, uh, then I think that you'd have a picture of the depth their claims uh, for asylum. And so today was uh, very important for us. Uh, I mentioned earlier in, in, in one of the interviews that, that you know, all of us wanted to see firsthand uh, and speak to these folks firsthand. Uh, I think you have a responsibility in the United States Congress uh, whenever you can to go see for yourself firsthand what's going on. Uh, and these members of Congress have taken it upon themselves to live up to that responsibility. Uh, and so thank you all for coming to San Antonio. Uh, earlier today, uh, we also had a chance to thank the many advocates in San Antonio who have helped in the nonprofit world uh, with legal services, um, uh, those of really of every race and ethnicity uh, and of every faith, uh, Catholic, Lutheran, Evangelical, uh, everybody from San Antonio. This is a hub for the social services and the advocacy that has been provided for the women and children in Carnes and Dilly and hosting my colleagues here. I couldn't be more proud today to be from San Antonio. Uh, so with that, uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. I'll say also we were joined by a wonderful colleague, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee uh, from Houston, Texas. Thank you, Sheila, for making it also. Was he invited? Oh, let, let me announce the other members. We've announced Stanny Hoyer, who's our minority whip, uh, Raul Grijalva, uh, who's head of the Pro Progressive Caucus, in the U.S. Congress. He is from Arizona and represents the border there. Uh, Judy Chu from California and Lucille Royball Allard from Los Angeles. Thank you all for coming. Okay, when they invited us, the media, to go inside, obviously it was a, a show. Just, uh, a, they didn't allow a lot of the women that uh, were in problems to speak to us, much less do any interviews with them. They chose who, you know, to speak to and all that. What kind of access do you have today? Was it a show for you just to, to, to be there, or what is what you can tell us? Go ahead. I, I, the visit was very compelling. Uh, we had individual private time with women and their kids. Uh, we were uh, selected And it, we, were select, we selected the people that we wanted to speak to because we knew of their cases prior to that. When we walked in the, in the yard area, people freely came up to us. There were some constrained parts, that were a little overbearing sometimes, in terms of where we could go and couldn't go, but generally open. And I think part of that dilemma is that you have a bifurcated decision-making system there. You have a private, for-profit prison, and you have Homeland Security that issues the contract and has oversight. Transparency and oversight, and, and esta cuestión continues to be critical and the role of the for-profit prison continues to be critical. Those still need to be looked at. But beyond that, my friend Mr. Castro's point, and the point that he reiterated before and again today, is women and children do not deserve to be in detention and should not be in detention, and the process should be done in a completely different way. Well, okay, kid. El punto, a mí se me hace clave que también se tiene que investigar y reconocer es el papel que las, la, las empresas de detención que están ahí para gananza uh, el papel que ellos quieren, tienen con, con, con tocante el tratamiento de estas mujeres y sus niños y también el papel de Homeland Security la agencia en términos de que cómo ellos 
dan atención al, al, al trabajo y a la actividad de, este, de esta empresa. Y además de eso, como dije anteriormente, esta visita fue emocional, tuvimos tiempo nosotros de discutir en detalle con muchas mujeres que nosotros escogemos para tener la entrevista, pero al fin del día ese centro de atención se tiene que cerrar y esas mujeres y esos niños deben de estar en un proceso donde no tienen que estar allí encarcelados. Gentlemen, along the and ladies, along those lines, uh, do you have any concern that these women may face retribution for speaking to you all? And secondly, secondly, I know that in your news conference last week, I know there were many concerns that you all voiced, be it suicide attempts, hunger strikes, mistreatment. Was it as bad as you thought last week? Well, we, we would not want to believe that there would be retaliation to any of the uh, mothers who spoke with us, but we did hand out our business cards and our phone numbers and ask them to give us a call if there were any adverse ramifications for their speaking uh, with us. And, you know, I'll let others speak, but we did hear us stories from women who <coughs> expressed, you know, very serious concern about the adverse impact on them and on their children who are not thriving uh, because they're in a, essentially a jail um, treatment that uh, I think would fall short of what we would expect. But uh, as I think Louis said, you can't make a good jail. The problem is that you can't have little children, little four-year-olds and their moms in jail. I, I don't think that's what, that's not what civilized societies do. And so we're, we're suggesting we need a better alternative. While these cases are pending, uh, the moms and these little babies should not be in jail. They should be uh, out uh, with a, a guarantee that they show up for their hearings and some, uh, some systems in place to make sure that happens with the, the churches that are asking to be part of the compliance plan that moms and kids show up for the hearing. We also know that when the volunteer lawyers are representing these people, well over 95% of them show up for their hearing. So that not only is more humane, it also saves the taxpayers a ton of money. I think that the women are courageous, they're brave, and they spoke to us uh, clearly about the situation that they confront. And I think our nation uh, owes a great degree of gratitude to their courage and to their bravery and to the clarity with which they spoke to us today. We're going to all get on a conference call with all of them in about a week. And we're going to ask them how things been going. They got our business cards. We made sure that there is a uh, collect call telephone that they can access and they know to call us. My staff, as the staff of every member here, have been informed. Somebody calls from the San Antonio detention centers outside of San Antonio, you take the call and you say, we accept the charges because we want to know about you. St Stoney Hoyer, I'm the Democratic Whip in the House of Representatives. Uh, we know them and uh, everybody knows that we know the women with whom we talk. I'm absolutely convinced that Secretary Johnson would not countenance in any way any retribution for these women showing the courage uh, to come forward and tell us of their uh, plight, of their fears, uh, and yes, of their aspirations. Uh, so my expectation is not only in that conference call, uh, but uh, I think we're all going to make it very clear to Secretary Johnson uh, that uh, he and his people uh, need to make sure that there is no uh, retribution uh, to women who at our request talk to us. Uh, that is our responsibilities as representatives of the American people uh, to see what uh, is being done. Uh, concerns have been raised. These women raised concerns, but others have raised concerns as well. And as I said as we were leaving, uh, whatever the law is, these women needed to be treated with the humanity uh, that America projects itself to be. Uh, and we expect that to be the case. Let me say, in, in closing as well, because we haven't mentioned it here, uh, 
One of the things that uh, we see here is a stark example of why comprehensive immigration reform is absolutely essential. There are 435 members of the House of Representatives. All 435 believe that the immigration <coughs> system is broken. And the failure uh, to address in a comprehensive way uh, immigration reform is a failure of the Congress of the United States. Uh, the United States Senate, of course, passed a comprehensive bill. I am very hopeful that uh, uh, the House of Representatives uh, can follow suit. That will not solve all the problems. Uh, but I am very pleased that Luis Gutierrez and Lucille Roybal Allard uh, invited me to come on this delegation. Uh, I wanted to be here with them. I signed the letter uh, saying that we had concerns about conditions. Now, this is not the first prison I've been in. I've been in a prison a lot as a lawyer, not as an incarcerator. <laughs> uh, I've been in prisons uh, in many countries of the world. Uh, I've been in detention facilities. Uh, and at every one of those, I have urged those who run those facilities to treat uh, the detainees uh, or the imprisoned in a humane manner. That is what we ought to expect of ourselves. And uh, these women were compelling uh, in their stories, uh, in uh, the abuse uh, that they had been subjected to, the threats they had been subjected to. Uh, now, all three of the women that we talked to were from Honduras. Three we talked uh, And our State Department knows that Honduras is one of the, if not the, most violent, dangerous nation in the world. So it should come as no surprise that a mother with small children uh, would want their children out of such an environment. Uh, gang infested, threatening families, children, uh, and all the citizens. So I appreciate very much Lucille, uh, Roy Allard, whose dad was a mentor of mine in the Congress of the United States, and Luis Gutierrez, who has been the extraordinary leader in this country on behalf of immigration reform. Now, as I understand it, the U.S. policy is that this detention is not supposed to be punitive in nature, but we're hearing conflicting reports about solitary confinement at these facilities. Mm -hmm. Also, there are reports that there is a quota system mm -hmm. for these system uh, for each detainee in each uh, detention center. Let me let me have uh, Zoe Lofgren <laughs> refer to that because she is the expert. She's the ranking member on the immigration subcommittee. We were all there together and we saw what, the, what was happening, but let me have a response. What we did was, because there were so many uh, women, we broke down into small groups and we each interviewed uh, a number of women and then when we went out into the common area, we were just swarmed with women and children, some of the children crying who wanted to tell mm -hmm. their stories. We did hear reports of uh, people detained uh, in a solitary uh, uh, confinement uh, with conflicting stories. That's very troubling and we plan to follow up with that, I can guarantee you. As for a quota, we did not hear uh, that. From, I did not hear that from the women, but I will say that... Um, well, they wouldn't know. That, that, that is correct. No, I will say that um, what I saw today did nothing but confirm my belief walking through the door mm -hmm. that we should end the jailing mm -hmm. of women and children uh, in these proceedings. It's, 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 it, it is by its nature punitive, whether it's intended to be or not. If you're doing bed counts, uh, you know, at night, you're lining up children and mothers to count them, you're uh, regimenting their lives, disciplining their children. It is a lockup. It is punitive, whether it's meant to be or not. It's not appropriate for this population. What can be done to really shut these centers down? I mean, the Homeland uh, Security Secretary has already said that this is uh, his policy <coughs> and it's going to continue. Um, how do you intend to try and shut these places down? Well, especially given international law, given court challenges, yeah. and here they are still. Well, I, I certainly wouldn't want to speak for the Secretary. I actually have a, a very high level of respect for Secretary Johnson. He is, I think, a man of integrity. He is a good lawyer. Uh, he is a smart person. Uh, how this will end could come several different ways. As you know, there is a, a court proceeding underway right now. Um, 
pointing out that these facilities do not comply with the floor settlement that the U.S. government entered into a number of years ago. Uh, there was just a week's extension for, for settlement discussions, but that may, a result may come out of that proceeding sooner than anything else. Certainly, the administration has the authority to, under law right now, to use alternatives to detention that will allow these families to show up in court at a, at a more affordable price. And in fact, there are discussions underway with, with the Lutherans and with the Catholics about doing those case management systems at quite an affordable price and certainly a, a very high level of appearance in, in the court. So What's your response that these are the only, this is the only way to keep families together to get through the court system? Well, it's simply incorrect. It's, it's, it's not, not correct. correct. The, and, the uh, city of San Antonio, just the citizens of the city and San Antonio would tomorrow, I have no doubt, open up their homes to these families and allow them to be here with love and respect and with dignity while they await their court. Look, let's, we're making too little of our nation. Uh, Americans are great people. Give them an opportunity and they'll step up. I have absolutely no doubt, number one. Number two, just think about it. You guys are seasoned veteran reporters. How many times haven't you seen someone charged with serious crimes allowed to be set with an ankle bracelet and a monitoring bracelet outside of a jail while they await trial? Let me reiterate what is what is what is so devastating about this is that these people have not been accused of any crime and yet they are still held in detention at a higher level of detention by the federal government than someone that has been prosecuted for a crime and very serious crime. Look, there are many other forms. The American people are ready. I want to say that one of the ways you change things is to bear witness to the inhumanity of the situation. And that's what we're here to say. And last, I want to join and echo something that Steny said. And, uh, and Zoe. Uh, if you needed to have a Secretary of Homeland Security with whom you could have a conversation and a dialogue, a very serious one, uh, that you know is a man that, that, that really believes in justice and fairness, we've already had those conversations with him. I know we're going to continue to have those conversations, so I have a lot of faith and that ability to take our stories back to him. He was here last week. I don't think that was an accident that the secretary was here last week. So why don't you let us continue to give you the reports of what's going on. We're going tomorrow to the other detention center. We will be meeting with the secretary. Let us put our thoughts and ideas together and, and, and give you a comprehensive view of what we I saw. I think one of the, one of the, to, to, to beg the question, your question, is that, and that's, I, I mentioned it earlier, that if if the if the nexus of, or if the if the decision is being made by Homeland Security as to who goes in and who gets out of detention, and that the for-profit prison is only a receptor, then obviously that's an easy decision. Less people, but if indeed, and then I think people have to really dig into that. If the private prison industry is driving the policy of who gets in yep. and who gets out toward guaranteed or unguaranteed minimums of bed occupation, then I think we have a substantive issue. One of the areas I think is to, for us to do is to dig into that part of the question, who's driving the policy? I'll just add, we're not going to quit till these detention centers are closed. That's it. We're not quitting. So we're going to put up a Luis, ¿qué posibilidades hay de que estas mujeres estén en realidad diciendo la verdad, lo que les están diciendo ustedes, lo que nos están diciendo nosotros? Y si hay... La posibilidad de que exista violación de derechos civiles y humanos en este lugar. Mire, <coughs> yo creo que una práctica um, sensata es siempre creerle a la mujer. Nosotros tenemos mucha historia de cuestionar a la mujer. Cuando la mujer no habla de abuso, cuando la mujer... Yo le creo a la mujer porque en... Todas las instancias históricamente se ha comprobado que, que no han dicho la verdad. Yo le creo a esas madres. Ellos nos hablaron y abrieron su corazón a nosotros, pero no solo eso. Demostraron, yo quiero que ustedes piensen un momento. 
Ellos están casi en una prisión, en detención. Y sin embargo, tuvieron la valentía de salir y decirle, yo quiero hablar con esos congresistas. Obviamente, yo quiero que ustedes piensen un momento. Muchas veces uno se queda callado. Ellas no se mantuvieron calladas. Yo le creo. Como dijo el congresista Hoyer, miren, yo no quiero que menospreciar, pero Honduras es un sitio muy peligroso. Eh, el Salvador, están las pandillas, los carteles, en Guatemala, las mujeres vienen huyendo. Y yo, mire, piense un momento, cada uno de los que están informando, cada uno de los reporteros, cuando hacen su paquete esta noche, pregúntese, si ustedes viviesen en El Salvador, en Guatemala, en Honduras, y tuviesen niños pequeños que iban a sufrir muerte o ultraje, ¿ah? ¿qué harían ustedes? Huirían también y vendrían aquí a este país pidiendo que auxilio. No debemos responder como país. Somos el país más poderoso del mundo, más rico del mundo. 50 mil niños no nos debe causar un trauma. Nos debe causar alegría que podemos recibirlo. All right, y'all. I'm going to let Jayla Jackson Lee uh, say the last word, and then we have we promised to meet with the advocates uh, tonight, and so we're going to head up after that. Well, I am uh, joining my colleagues uh, today, and uh, I wanted to emphasize two points that I think are crucial. Thank you very much. And to emphasize the diversity of this task force, self-appointed task force, of different committees, and of course our whip. But for those of us who were at the border last year uh, and the horror of the nation believing we were under siege, we now know that we were not under siege, that no terrorists were coming across the border, and these were women and children. And I think the comment that Congressman Grijalva is the one I want to emphasize. And that is, I believe, not conspicuously and openly, but the private prison system drives these numbers. These are contracts with the federal government, and I too have faith in the Secretary of Homeland Security. So I think there are ways for us to address the question of closing these prisons, uh, or at least closing them to people who are seeking asylum. Uh, and begin to utilize the vast array of nonprofits that go from San Antonio, my colleagues, uh, district, and the great work you have done on this issue, all the way to Houston, Texas, who opened their doors last year to say, we have nonprofits and alternatives. So my issue on the Judiciary Committee, alongside of the law firm, is not only the immigration side, but the private prison side. I am not against people's jobs. But I do believe that the economic aspect of private prisons should not drive the humanitarian needs of women who are seeking asylum and are seeking refuge. That is what I hope as we go forward we'll have the opportunity to do so. The Secretary has indicated his interest in looking for alternatives. And I think this team, this task force, this group of members will drive that engine and we will see some results very soon. Can I just say one thing, just one thing though, that I think it's also important. It's not just our impressions that we're talking about. There are credible psychologists, social workers who have gone down there and have testified and have written about the negative impact that the, these facilities are having on the development uh, and mental health of not just the women, but especially the children. So this isn't just our impression. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that uh, I came in thinking that we should end family detention and after being swarmed by women who had these stories uh, with children that were crying uh, with $10,000 bonds making it impossible for them to get out, uh, I knew that uh, we were right. And so we go back and we are, go we are resolved to end family detention. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, just, yeah, I'll stay back and, and answer. All right, very good. We are going to get him up soon. Hey, Carlos.